Hello, everyone. And first of all, thank you for coming. And welcome to this Reactive Hardcore session and beyond the Reactive Hardcore. So today we are going to basically, today I'm going to take off your brain. This is my main um, goal for today because it's a really hardcore topic. And uh, before we start, I want to prepare you a little bit and explain what we are going to do during this session. So in order to make you possible to switch session and to make your day as, as more productive as this possible. Because, yeah, that's why we are here, staying here. And for me, it's important to, to deliver the, the, the valuable information for you. So let's talk a little bit for whom this talk. And basically, this talk for everyone who is doing reactive programming or planning to do reactive programming these days. So how many of yours are doing reactive programming today? OK, just one, two three, four hands. Uh, how many of you are planning to, to do anything related to reactive programming? Do you have any projects related to reactive Spring, Project Reactor, or RxJava? So this will be useful for you as well. Um, because during this session, we are going to learn how to debug all these internals. We are going to learn what's going on under the hood of, for example, Project Reactor or RxJava 2. We are going to understand how modern libraries work, what patterns are used under the hood, what concurrency practice um, are used under the, uh, in, inside the, those libraries. And finally, like this is the main idea of this talk, is to give you information how to build your own library, if you, if you need at some point in time, to build your own, your own operators, uh, which could do anything related to your business logic. So we are going to, to to, to cover all these low-level things. So be prepared to real low-level things in, inside uh, reactive libraries like Project Reactor or RxJava, and be prepared to see lots of concurrency, atomics, and uh, related to multi-threading uh, like patterns and features. So are you ready? Are you still with me? So let's start. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Olok. Uh, I'm from Ukraine, from Kiev. I work for Netify. At this company, we are building a future reactive streams protocol, like doing like proper reactive streams over the network as an application protocol. This is call it R socket. In turn, I am a contributor to Project Reactor, so I learned what's going on inside Project Reactor. I wrote a few operators, and I know how to how to write a new one, Project Reactor again, if you words. And I'm organizing a few conferences in. Uh, co-organizing a few conferences in Ukraine, Kiev. Uh, this is Davox um, GECon, so if you're curious and if you want to visit Ukraine and enjoy Kiev, I'm welcoming you to, to, to take a look at those conferences. And if you need some discounts, please let me know. I will do my best to share good discounts with you. All right. Yeah, a little bit more marketing. I wrote a book related to reactive programming in Sprint, so again, if you're curious, I can share PDFs with you, or if you want to buy some uh, paper-covered book, uh, I can share some discounts with you as well. All right, and final agenda. So what we are going to do today. First of all, we will start with reactive stream specification. We are going to understand what's, what is that and how it works, what is, what is hidden inside. Then we are going to implement the hardest part of reactive stream specification, which is publisher. You will see why it's this, this is the hardest part. And afterwards, we are going to implement uh, your own, our own Rx kind of Rx uh, library, which will include a few operators, subscribers, and, this imp and provide the same API. So that's our main uh, agenda for today. And let's start with the first stage with reactive streams. So how many of you have, have ever heard about uh, reactive stream specification? OK, just a few hands. For, okay, let me then ex um, quickly explain what uh, reactive streams for everyone else have never heard about that. So basically, reactive stream specification, it's a specification. It's a document which specifies 3 plus 1, which is a mix of uh, three previous interfaces. So it provides three standard interfaces, like publisher, subscriber, and subscription. And it, it introduces the most important part uh, of nowadays microservices, which is back pressure. Have you ever heard about back pressure before? OK, so let me quickly introduce what back pressure is. And I need one volunteer from the audience who want to help me. 
Like it will be a simple, really simple game. Like we will be, uh, I will be showing how m today's microservice and do microservices is doing communication. So I need one person who will throw balls in, in to me. Just one person from from the audience. Come on, wake up! It's almost afternoon, so you you have to be awake, awakened. So come on, one person who wants. So the game is really simple. You have to, yeah, take the, those balls. Yeah, here we go. And now, um, yeah, let's stay here in order to make the camera record me. And now you have to, once I say it, I'm ready. This is what's going on in our microservices and communication between in our system. One service just started and it say, okay, I'm ready. My API is kind of healthy, so everyone should, every client or HTTP client should just send requests to me, right? That's how we are doing our microservices. So we are going to show how this, why this communication is not good, because we don't have back pressure in it. So once I say it, I'm ready, you have to just quickly throw balls into me as quick as possible, because you're, you're a client and your main uh, goal to, to send requests as, as fast as possible. So I'm ready, so just, okay. Ah. Yeah, this basically, as you can see, I have only two hands in my capacity, right? Every service has proper capacity in it. Like, it could be a few threads, it could be a few workers, stay here, I, I, would, need, I would need your help still. So, we have to consider our capacity. At some point in time, our capacity and our possibility to process some requests could uh, went out of, uh, of resource. So we, we can't process requests, and that's what happened to me. I have only two hands in order to catch all the balls. That's why a few of them started drop, dropping. And that's basically what's happening during communication or sending requests from one service to another. And we have to solve all this problem because sometimes we have to deliver every request to, to, our, uh, to our server, right? That's, sometimes this is important. That's why in order to show the, the capacity of the system, instead of just saying I'm ready, I can say, okay, my capacity is just to hand, so I'm, I'm going to say you how many kind of requests I'm ready to process at this point in time because I can do some math in order to calculate the speed of putting a ball into my pack pocket or something like that. So based, based on that, I can say, okay, I'm ready to process three balls at a time. And now the same client will be sending with the same speed three balls, and once I process three of them, I can request another three, and asynchronously request more and more and more. And in that way, I can preserve my capacity, because I'm saying, okay, I'm ready to handle only three, so I know that client won't send me more than three balls. Does it make sense? So this is a mechanism how we can uh, show or control the flow of elements from one client, from one publisher to subscriber. So now let's repeat the same exercise. And now along with saying I'm ready, I will be saying how many balls I'm ready to handle. So I'm ready to handle two balls. One, two. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine to just put everything into my pocket and say, okay, I'm ready to handle another two. Please send it to me. And I requested another two balls. And so forth and so on, this action could be repeated again and again to get everything to from publisher to subscriber. Thank you. So this is how back pressure in reactive streams works. Uh, did you understand wh why back pressure is important and what it basically is? Great. That's amazing. This is the first stage of our presentation. We understood why back pressure is really good. Then let's take a look at the reactive stream specification and learn how it works and how back pressure um, exposes in those interfaces. First of all, we have a publisher. The publisher is plain as, as, as much as possible. Like one interface, one method that accepts subscriber. Nothing complex here, right? Should be, shouldn't be really rocket science. Then we have a subscriber. Subscriber is a little bit more complex because it has four methods, like on next, on error, on complete. On next allows us to send, to notify our subscriber that there is a new kind of element. On error allows us to notify that there is an error or something went wrong on the publisher side. And on complete says that this is a terminal operator as well as on error. This is two terminal operations, which says, okay, there is no more data. So this, you should consider this as, as the end of the stream and do some cleanups, etc. 
There is one additional method call it onSubscribe, and this is basically the, new, the newest method in reactive stream specification, which allows us to do some handshake. So before we had only, like in Rx Java first, we had only on error, on next, and on complete. And now there is on subscribe, which allows publisher to send a subscription, which kind of a handshake with a contract between publisher and subscriber. And then using this subscription interface, subscriber can say, okay, I want to, for example, unsubscribe from the stream by calling cancel, or I want to request few more elements if I'm ready to consume them. This is basically the method which allows us to, to say, I'm ready to handle n elements from the publisher. Does it make sense, this mechanism? So this is basically a synchronous way to, to say, I'm, I want five elements, 10 elements, or a few more. Now let's take, try to connect everything into the, kind of into the paper. So we have publisher, we have subscriber, subscriber calls subscribe method in order to start listening to, uh, to new events. Nothing will happen until, uh, until subscribe method. And once we subscribe it, publisher sends subscription, and now we can say, okay, I want a five elements, and publisher will send five on next or less, because it's possible to have less elements that request it. This is basically all the interaction we have to know. And in order to start, because we want to create first our first publisher, let's try to create, uh, to modify this interface, to extend it, and to create simplest array publisher, because why not? Because we have, for example, in some cases, we want to iterate in some asynchronous way o over some array of data, so why not implement this uh, just for demo purpose? Of course, if you are trying to implement, uh, to take a look at this uh, method, try to implement the main idea of data sending, we can write something like this. The simplest way of calling on next in order to deliver all elements uh, from our array. It could look really simple, however, it won't work. First of all, it won't work because of the specification, which contains lots of rules. I'm joking, there is only 41 rule, but this is enough to make it really crazy and complex um, solution. So if you're going to look at this specification, yeah, let's do that. Let's go into, to, to go to web page. We will see, like this is an official GitHub repository for reactive streams for GVM, for Java. You will see lots of rules for publisher, for subscriber, which explains how should publisher send to subscriber, which guarantees there is, and so forth and so on, and for subscription. This is important to figure out that there is lots of rules which we have to implement, right? This is not simple task. Of course, we are not going to read all of them because this, is, this would be too, too boring. But I prepared a few most important from, uh, from my point of view to start implementing our publisher. So the first rule is execution in order. So first of all, you have to call on subscribe method because this is a beginning of interaction. And why it's beginning? Because publisher have to send a subscription. So it's a handshake between subscriber and publisher. So subscriber called subscribe and publisher as a result reacted with the call on subscription with its subscription or kind of contract to control back pressure. Then we have to expect a few on next method. It could be zero or an invocation. It depends on kind of publisher. So it could be finite or infinite publisher. And finally, we should expect only one on error or on complete. In case on error, there is should, shouldn't be any on complete. So only one or error on error terminal signal. signal. In case we got on complete, we shouldn't expect any on error calls. This is important. Is it clear? Plain rule, right? The next rule is related to back pressure. So if you request that five element, we should expect at least five on next call and not more. This is important rule related to back pressure control. Then there is a rule from one guy called it Igor Bugayan, because he is really popular in the, in the Eastern, uh, Eastern Europe part of Eastern kind of part of the Europe. But he basically says that null is not good. And I agree with him on this, uh, on this statement. And developers of reactive stream specification also says that null is not good. Just imagine that you are trying to process stream of data, stream of real data. But that, then at some point in time, you got null. So what are your actions with regard to null? Filter. Sometimes it's, it's impossible because you expect some map operation to be invoked with null. 
return null, you make more problem to someone on the downstream because someone else should be handle this null. So in general, this is really bad val kind of value and it shouldn't be used during data processing. And reactive stream specification states that null is prohibited value and in case null happens in your stream, you should call on error. This is important part of the specification. Then there is more tricky part of specification related to invocation. So it's possible to say, okay, to, re to request one element, get one element, and then request again, new one element, and, and get on next and request new one element. And it's important to preserve stack, stack kind of stack trace lens shorter. And it's important to, because if we, go, we get two, two kind of too long stack trace, we will get out of uh, stack trace overflow, and we have to avoid this uh, exception in our communication. So we will see what could happen if we try to, to test this case. And finally, if you say it cancel, we have to stop sending elements eventually. So this is basically all set of the rules that we have to remember for the beginning. So let's try to implement them. Do you have any questions so far related to the rules? Okay. So then let's go to, to our IDE, and let me quickly introduce what's going on in this project. So this is basic, basic, uh, pretty, pretty essential Java project, uh, which uses Gradle in order to, to build everything. I'm using here reactive streams. So one few more, like kind of a few more notes uh, on the reactive streams. This is so cool specification that it became a part of JDK 9. So if you try to, yeah, let me switch to, for example, GDK 12, but it's uh, available in GDK uh, 9 as well. And if you're going to call, not flags, but flow, you will see the package called Java Util Concurrency, which is basically a part of uh, GDK. And if you're going to look inside this package, you will see publisher, subscriber, and subscription. So it's so cool. This specification is so valuable for, valuable for GVM and in general the world. So it became a part of uh, standard JDK. And you can use, for example, if you're using uh, JDK 9 or higher, you can use reactive streams interfaces from the GDK without bringing any additional library. But since I'm, I want to use, for example, the standard JDK uh, not 8, which, is, which doesn't contain uh, these interfaces, I will have to bring this additional library to my project. But if you're using higher version, you can take everything from, uh, from the standard JDK. That's good. And now let's take a look at what we have here. First of all, we have one class. This is basically our array publisher with the same implementation we saw a few slides ago. And we have a test. Today we are going to, to do TDD, so we are going to write tests and figure out whether our impl implementation is incorrect. This is the simplest way to, to implement something step by step, just by modifying small pieces, and it will make simpler and more clear uh, how I get the final solution for you. Does it make sense? Okay, great. So, let's start. This is just the beginning, and we have to implement the first rule, which says that everything should be called in order. The first, the first test I'm going to write with you, so I'm just create, I'm just slowly create a, a test method, but then I will cheat a little bit. I will try to do something like, uh, like this in order to, not like this, but like this, in order to implement everything. So be prepared to see kind of a few lines of code at the, just in a moment because I uh, input a template uh, instead of writing everything slowly and boringly. So let's start to write the first test, which tests that everything should be called in, in order, in particular order. So let's do that test that our publisher should call subscriber methods in particular order. Too long, but it's fine. Long methods names, it's fine for Java. And now we have to test it somehow. So we have our array. Publisher, let's create an instance. And this instance expects some array. Because this is array publisher, so we have, in order to create this publisher, we have to pass some uh, array of data. We have some additional method, like utility method, which allows us to generate a range of elements, 
like the simplest way to generate something. And we are going to use it in order to generate, for example, an, ar an array of, let it be five elements. So let's generate an array. And now let's supply this array to our publisher. The next step, in order to check everything, we have to subscribe. This is an important part of, of the specification. We have to subscribe to the publisher in order to start listening to, to, to incoming data. So we have to provide a subscriber. This will be a long subscriber. And we have to implement, what's wrong with that? OK, long. And we have to provide, of course, a particular implementation of those methods. First of all, we have to request something. And we have to somehow uh, kind of record that this, this method were invoked. So let's create another, uh, another array list, for example, in order to put signals in it, observed, observed signals. Yes, I understand that this is a little bit slow and boring, but this is just the first beginning in order to, make, to, be, to start be more burnt. And now we're going to say, OK, this will be a 0. So this is the first inv invocation or a 0 invocation. Then we expect at least one invocation here. So every signal that appears here should be recorded as 1. And then we expect that everything should be fine, so we, we should observe 2. Afterwards, if you're going to, to make a verification, let's do assertion. And let's assert uh, observed signals, first of all. Observed, where is that? Observed signals. We have to, it ha have to contain exactly 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, because 5 invocation of 1. And then it should contain 2. Does it make sense? According to, to the logic of uh, methods invocation. So we have to, to wait for this kind of stream. And sometimes we have, since streams could be, uh, could be asynchronous, sometimes we have to create something like countdown latch in order to wait for completion of the stream. Because we know that completion is calling off on complete methods, so, so let's just create countdown latch. With one, with one kind, kind of countdown in order to count down it here. And then we are going to await it here. For example, for, uh, for time unit, for one second. So as far, so far so good, everything clear, how we are going to interact with publisher, subscriber, and collect some data. So let's just simply run this test and figure out whether it works or not. Just run, buddy. Come on. Oh, yeah, I have to say that this is a test. This is important part. OK, I'm running this test, and now we have to see something. And it's crushed. So it's crushed. It says that we got 1, 1, 1, 1, but we expected 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2. And this is clear that our implementation does not invoke on subscribe method. It just invokes on next, and that's it. So we have to to fix it somehow. The simplest implementation is to say, okay, if you want to kind of satisfy the text, uh, the tests, um, the test kind of ruling or test um, requirements, we have to simply call all of these methods one by one. Why not? Like this. Because TDD is about the simplest implementation and iterative, uh, iterative uh, implementation with refactoring. So we have to implement something like this right, the simplest one, and we will satisfy our test needs. But it's clear that this is not correct because we have few more one tests or a few, uh, few more rules. For example, we have to test now, right now back pressure. This is an important part of reactive streams, right? So everything should be sent with back pressure. Let's check whether it works with is back pressure support. Now we created absolutely the same test. Do you see it? Identical countdown, identical collection of observed elements. We generate stream uh, like the source of data, create our publisher, and then create subscriber. However, in this case, in order to control kind of flow manually, I move subscription out of uh, out of subscriber. In this case, I requested, for example, 100 of elements, so I can't expect that uh, 
I get kind of I uh, won't get uh, those elements without back pressure. So exp I got only five elements. I requested for 100, so at least five should should be delivered, right? In order to check whether back pressure works, I don't want to request elements here, even though it's correct way to request them here. I want to control everything manually, so I want to start my test with checking whether there is no element so far, because I haven't requested anything. Then I request one element, I expect only one element, like zero element. Then I expect, then I request few more elements, and I, then I expect two elements in my collection in general, and so forth and so on until I get the completion signal here, so it, it would mean that nothing will happen afterwards and I can check that my collection is absolutely the same as uh, it was at the beginning, like it was generated by generated method. Does it make sense? Okay, so let's try to run this test and figure out whether it works or not. It doesn't. So at the, first, at the very first step here, we observed all the elements in our uh, in our collection, which means that there is no back pressure at all. So our subscriber just, our publisher just sent everything it had, and this is incorrect behavior, right? So any idea how we can fix that? Any idea? Friends, just, just try to help me a little bit. Just try to enable uh, your nuts, start thinking how to fix this implementation in the simplest way. So where we call, like, which method is responsible for uh, sending the demand from subscriber to publisher. How we request data? By request data. By calling request method, right? So, in order to react to this call, where should we put the logic of data sending? So, into request, right? So, this is the simplest. We have to move this guy here and just try to run this test and see that now it should be a little bit better because we expected like this, the first invocation were passed, like this rule were uh, satisfied, so now we failed at this one because we requested for one but we got everything. It's clear because uh, our implementation sends everything so far. So the simplest solution again is to say, okay, if you requested n elements, let's just say, send n elements, right? So let's go to restart this test and now we see that we got two elements, but we expected two different elements, right? In this case, we got exactly two elements. However, it's something uh, unexpected here because we expected like a sequence like zero, one, two, three, four, five, but we got zero, zero. Any idea why? Right. We, we always start from the same value. So how to solve this problem? We have to have some state, right? For example, index. In order to say, okay, someone requested n elements, so I have to record how many elements I have already sent in order to start exactly from that point of sending, right? So let's create an index. Let's put this index here. It will be by default zero. And we have now to, to maybe use index in order to say, or let's just use this guy here. Let's just do something like this. And maybe we have to send elements, not by index, but until, some, uh, until something. So I guess we have to implement, uh, to add another one uh, kind of condition here, because we have to send elements until some point, until our array, array length is uh, not reached by index, right? So we have to send elements until we got, for example, the end of the so data source. Does it make sense? Right. So let's try to run it again. And now it passed. Looks good. A few more rules which is not covered by this test should be implemented because, for example, just imagine that we have to check that on complete must be called only once, right? This is uh, an important part of reactive streams. This is only one terminal signal which should appear only once. So, for example, in our case, incomplete will appear a few more times, right? If you're going to put, for example, let's do something like this, system out println, 
completion, and we are going to run this test, we will see that we got four completion. This is absolutely incorrect. So in order to fix this part, we have to say that we have to call completion only and only if index is reach the array length, right? So at some point in time, index will overflow or reach the same, will be, the equal, will be equal to array length. This will be after we increment E and we increment index. So we will get something like index equal to array. So this condition won't, won't happen, and we will just out of iteration. And now we have to check whether index is equal to array length. And if it's happened, we have to complete our streaming and return from execution. Does it make sense? OK, so now if, I go, if we are going to rerun this, we will see only one completion method, which is good for us. All kind of all requirements were satisfied. All right, what next? Let's move forward. And the next rule that we have to implement is verification on null, because it's important to, to, to send only uh, kind of valuable values. Now it's, it means nothing in some cases. So let's just create a test that checks that we don't send anything with null. And this test is the same simple. Like we create an array with one element null. So we, ex we expect that, for example, an error should be called, right? So let's just run not this one, because we want to execute a particular test suite, test case. And now we see that we expected null, but we got incomplete. So it's something unexpected. Because if you're going to log this guy, system out println, we will see got value plus a long. And if you're going to rerun, we will see got value null. This is incorrect behavior. So we have to satisfy our specification, and we have to somehow change the implementation. What will be the simplest fix here? Maybe just check that the value is null, not equal to null. Does it make sense? Like here is our element, and in case element equal to null, not here like this, we have to say, okay, this is something incorrect. You have wrong body. You got incorrect array source. So you have to say, okay, new null pointer exception, but not just by throwing it. Because just imagine again, asynchronous data sending. This is, for example, WebSocket data stream. And you just thrown another error in publisher, which is running in absolutely different thread than your subscriber. So your subscriber will never see this error. So it, it has to be sent over the on error kind of channel in the specific way. So we have to create something like this and say, OK, got null element. And of course, we have to return from our execution. And now if you're going to rerun our test, we will see that it just passed. So far, so good. Is it clear? Yeah, I have a yep. Uh, genuine question about the test because you are using current knowledge, but I don't see any concurrency here. Are you going to do it later? Yeah. Okay. We, are, we will see concurrency later. This is just an example how you should try to write tests if you don't have any additional libraries like in Project Reactor. So you should kind of assume that everything is asynchronous and can happen in any thread, so you have to wait for a particular signal, and only after that you should uh, kind of uh, try to verify all the collected data. And uh, back to the last point, you said that this uh, extension, why do you do return on set of continuous, for example? Uh, because on error is a final signal. Like, like it's, it's, it's a terminal signal, so we don't have, if we, if, if we are going to, for example, continue, it means that we can send null. If we got null, we have to call on error. But after on error, we can, if we just call on continue, we, will, we can see on next call. Like we got terminal signal and then one, another element. This is violate specification because specification again says, like you, we can go back to, to the slides, specification says only one on subscribe. This is just the first signal ever we have expect, then we have expect n or zero on next, and once we get out of uh, data, in data source, we have to call, call on complete, or in case we observed something wrong in our publisher on the path of sending data sending, we have to call on error and stop s kind of propagating another element. So you don't care about the rest of the yes, 
they will be dropped. Like this is uh, details of the implementation because you can implement in the, any way you want. For example, in Project Reactor, you can put a hook and uh, kind of try to observe dropped data. Or there is a few other op operators which allows you to just um, kind of skip the error in some cases. But again, this is the details of particular implementation. By specification, only one error signal, terminal signal should appear. And after that, no, nothing else. So it's clear. Great. That's why I'm using here return in order to stop. OK, I'm done. All right. This is good, but let's move to more complex and tricky tests. Now let's try to, since we have all, almost implemented everything, let's try to make a test related to recursion. So in order to test that everything will be fine in case I do something like this, and here in this case I'm doing like, I'm requesting one element, element. this is absolutely allowed and absolutely correct to request one element because you can have only one hand in your, uh, in your system, for example, like Node.js data processor. So you request one element, you got this element, and then you request another one element. And then you, request, you got another one element and request another one element. And so forth and so on. So what should happen? Any idea? Probably. Let's try to, to run it and see. OK, so we have to import this, uh, this guy. Import static. And now let's try to run it. Note this is a run test. So let's run this one. And as it was predicted, we got stack overflow. And if you are going to, to take a look at the stack, we will see. A next request. A next request. A next request. And we can scroll it until the, the end of, of the time. And de it depends on the size of the stack. But in any case, if we request too many elements, we can end up with some super long stack which is out of uh, capacity for the stack. So how to fix it? Let's go back to to our implementation, and let's take a look again at this code. Any idea how we can prevent? Is the Say it again. Yes. So basically, what what's going on here? Our subscriber request elements, so it controls the stream of data. So, but depends on some cases. It could be a request for one element or for two element. Doesn't matter. Uh, it, it should be called either during the unsubscribe phase or during the iterating over the next. A uh, specification says that it's prohibited to call request here because it violates. It, it makes no sense. At this point, you should, exp uh, you should consider sp kind of subscription as expired because this is a terminal signal and you don't have to request for, for more data because this is just the end of the stream. There is no more data. But yeah, this... Uh, kind of usage of subscription is absolutely proper. So any idea how we can fix that? Basically, we maybe have to put some flag which says that, all right, we have already started sending elements. Maybe you just have to say, OK, I requested that amount of elements and return back without going into the loop of iterating over the stacks. Any idea how we can do that? Any flux? Basically, we have to say, OK, if this is a first, kind of, yeah. If this is a first request, let's just iterate over the data source. In case someone iterates, rates, we have to exit and just say, OK, we requested that number of elements. One of the options is, of course, to, to create some Boolean field. But then, in any case, we would have to create another field called requested in order to, to store the number of requested elements. And there is one common pattern in all reactive libraries I'm going to show you, which allows you to reduce the number of created fields, and in this way simplify the general implementation. So since we can request long n elements, we have to create long field 
call it requested. And what we have to do then? First of all, we have to figure out at the very beginning what is the initial size of requested. Kind of, let's call it initial requested. Then we have, of course, to increase the number of requested elements because this is one of the important tasks. And then we have to figure out whether initial requested equal to zero. In case it, it is equal to zero, we have to, to do some business logic, like we have to send elements. In case initial requested is higher than zero, for example, someone requested one and we're still iterating, and we know that we decrement requested maybe later here, initial requested will still be more than zero. So in case it's more than zero or not equal to zero, we have to just return. So this pattern co called work in progress. And this kind of verification is basically checking whether someone is working or sending data at, at this point in time or not. And in case someone, for example, sent, got on next and then requested, uh, call it request method again, this kind of, this parameter will be higher than zero we just increase the, num the total number of requested elements and exit the stack. And the same kind of previous worker or the previous stack will continue sending data without entering new one and new one and new one again. Is it clear? Not clear. Maybe I have to debug it a little bit in order to show how it works. Okay. Yes, of course I have to request to decrease the requested field at some point in time. This is absolutely correct. For example, I can do this at this point in time. So I can create field, call it, for example, send, because I'm using, for example, this E. I have to somehow uh, start using it, not just for fun, but just for some reason. Uh, and I can say in this way that, uh, for example, like this. So here is the flag or field that indicates how many elements we have sent, right? Because on every stage of iterating, we will increase this field by one. So afterwards, once we exit the for loop, we will have the specific number of sent elements. So once we are going to exit this guy, in general, the method, we, we, we will be able to decrease requested field by the same number, number of sent elements. Does it make sense? OK, so now let's go to debug it a little bit in order to figure out how it works. So let me just put this, uh, this call here. And now let me go back to my test and execute only this guy. Not like this, but with debugging. OK, so let's do this in this way. Running new idea on Mac usually doesn't work. So we got initial requested to 0. Do you see it? This is the first invocation. If you're going to look at the stack trace, yeah, this is the stack trace, you will see this is just a first call to my test. Then I call subscribe, and my publisher called on subscribe method. And of course, we got on subscribe method call here, and we requested for very first element. So since now nobody is iterating here so far, we can just bypass this word, this verification. And we can start sending elements one by one. So we are going to, 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 to check all the cases. And we got element, which is the first zero element. And now we are going to send it. We got this element, put it into collection, and we requested for a few more, right? Here. We are here, but requested is one. So initial requested at the point of entering the method is one. So we have to just increase the number, the general number of requested element, and then we have to exit in order to not increase the stack size, right? So once we increased, made this action, we have to exit the stack, but we still continue to iterate in. Because, yeah, now we have to, to, to make a few more uh, changes in our, in our implementation. Instead of checking the end, we have to check and use requested number, because requested shows to, to us the general number, the total number of requested elements at this point in time, right? So before we used n, again, let me show you n. The n, the n was uh, kind of shown or um, 
expose the number of requested elements at this point in time and this method call. But since we are using some total field which collects all the requests, we have to use instead of n, which is local variable, we have to use some global field in order to iterate until request ends. And now if we're going to run this debug again, we will see that we won't exit for loop iteration after the first send. So again, initial request at zero, we're just iterating through all the, case, the, through all the stops. Iterate, here is an, on next call, we requested another one element, initial request at one, we incremented global field to two, so now we have to deliver two elements. That's fine, but we don't have to increase the stack size because someone is iterating. We are doing iterating at kind of at some stack already, so we have to just exit this one, we have to just exit on next, and we have to continue our iterating because send is still kind of less than requested. And here we go. We entered the next loop, we took the next element, sent it, incremented, requested again, so a general total size now is three, and exited. And so forth and so on until we got the end of the stream. And in case we reach the end of the stream, it will be the exit. In case we request less than the number of uh, elements, for example, we will decrease that. For example, we requested for 1,000 of elements, but we have 2,000. So at some point in time, we will just decrease this field. Does it make sense? Great. And in this case, we will just pass everything. So the test is passed. Yep. Right. That's fine. We, we start from the simplest and move to the co more complex step by step. Because if, we're, if we are going to consider everything at once, it will be too hard. Because you will see what will happen in a few, in a few minutes. But just let's take uh, from the simplest and then move step by step. Yeah. We can do that, that's fine. I'm just trying to make this field useful. For example, we can do everything in batch. Since we increase in one field one by one, and we have this check-in, in, in some cases we would have to provide another, for example, field in order to figure out whether we send everything. So yeah, basically we can use it here, but I prefer to do everything in batch, so it would mean that I have to iterate one field, and then I had to decrement everything at once without doing additional instruction for my CPU. Yeah, you can do it either way. This is my prefer kind of uh, my way. Okay, so far so good. Just more questions. Yep. Right, so just imagine that we are doing something like this. Let's create some additional field capacity. Just, just in case, right? So we have to capacity and let's make, for example, final. This is 500 of elements. And let's make this guy like received. We count how many elements we received. And now just imagine that we have some batch, batch API which allows us to send all collected elements to the database at once. So we want to request one by one, one by one, just a simple case. So we want to increment this guy, capacity, not the capacity, but received. And once, uh, what's wrong with that? Oh yeah, it's final. So once received reached the capacity, we want to do some actions, but we want to do uh, kind of the next, it, um, the next step of requesting elements only after this, after this batch uh, kind of finalize it or execute it uh, finally. So it could be, for example, something like new thread. We can write some runnable here and say, okay, 
do some complex data storing at once. So we can use, for example, all collected data here from this collection, just in case. So, and we can, for example, do some thread sleep, because we can, in order to, to make this task really um, long running. Uh, not like this, but, okay, so what's wrong? Like this, and we have to call start. And now we have to surround it with, and then we want to request for afterwards, once we uh, process data, we want to request for another iteration. So we say, okay, for example, received now equal to zero, and now we are ready to request for a few more elements. In this case, so let me run this sample, everything will be fine. But we reach this point at some point in time. Uh, say it again, sorry? Um, yeah, if you put requested to zero, it will be a specification violation. We will get to this point. Uh, why? Which one? Okay, so array publisher, I subtract to... Uh, Yeah, of course we can put this to zero. Yeah. That will be totally fine as well. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. I will be used this, this condition or this uh, kind of this case in a little like a little bit further. But you will see why I did exactly like this. You will see that. So it's absolutely correct in this implementation, in particular this implementation, to say like this. But in the future, once we reach multi-threading, you will see that it would be a little bit tricky, more tricky. But yeah, let's keep this, uh, this kind of um, requested zero in like this. And let's move forward, because we kind of implemented all of the cases. So let me roll back this guy in order to not fail the test, because everything could be wrong. And yeah, let's run this guy again in order to make sure it works. Running. Yeah, it passes. All good. Final test, of course, will be related to cancellation. This is the only test we left on kind of this. This is the only rule we left un untested. So the basic, basically what we are doing here, we call the cancel and then we call request in order to make sure that data el that elements won't be sent because we cancel it our subscription does it make sense the simplest the simplest ver verification afterward we check that uncomplete is not appear so if you're, if uh, i want to test this guy i have to say that uh, that assertion should be false because after cancellation, we shouldn't expect incomplete because this is a total cancellation of stream. We don't have to wait for, uh, for on any incomplete, incomplete signals. This, we just say, okay, we don't want to receive anything. So we have to expect false here, and we have to expect a uh, kind of empty collection. So let's just run this test and see whether it works or not. It, it won't be working because we received, we reached incomplete signal, which is illegal one in this situation. So we have to fix it somehow. We have to fix our publisher. Any idea how we can do that? Right, the simplest is to say, okay, to create Boolean flag, like Boolean flag, cancel it, and say we have to put cancel it to true if cancel method called, and then we have to put a few more conditions for example, if cancel it, we have to just simply return, and, nothing, and we don't have to do anything else. 
We have to do that here, and of course we have to do to put a few more bars here in case it happens exactly before completion. We received all the elements. It's kind of the end of the stream, but we called cancel, so we don't have a, uh, have to wait for on complete. Yeah. It's it's here, so we can just put it here. That's fine. Just the matter of order. We can put it here as well. So it, 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 it will be the same kind of. Uh, it won't change. It won't affect anything because this is just a matter of orders in this case because it's just the same loop. So in any point in time, we will reach uh, this kind of cancellation verification uh, earlier or later. It doesn't kind of. It doesn't matter. But this is fine. All right. So let's move forward and let's run this test and figure out that it works. Yeah, it passed. All good. So we created, we wrote only, how many tests we wrote? So let's take a look. Five tests, but we spent a lot of time, right? Yeah, question. Collect. Yes, so in, for these tests, I expect that I don't receive any elements because I canceled my stream, so it should be considered as canceled, and publisher publisher shouldn't send me any elements after that. This is important part. Could you this on subscription? Yes, because I cancel my subscription once I get it. But in case I cancel it at some point in time, of course I should, for example, should expect a few more elements, but not more than kind of I collected. So I can say, okay, I received. I expect five elements, but I got, for example, in the collection it could be 10,000, but I should exactly get five elements. But not for this case, not for this test. So we got only five tests so far, but this is a little bit complex challenge, right? To implement everything correctly, to follow the specification. And in general, how many of you likes to write tests? Okay, just a few hands. Every, everyone is pretty lazy as me. I don't like to write tests, that's why I'm using code snippets, as you have seen, right? I'm just cheating by putting my test like this. And writing proper tests is really a complex challenge for developers. Fortunately, Reactive Streams specification uh, engineers and developers considered it as a complex challenge and prepared for us a solution, call it TCK. So if you're going to open um, again, GitHub page, if you're going to take a look at, at, at what modules we have here, you will see something called TCK or TCK folder. If, if we are going to read what TCK is, we will see that this is technology comp compatibility kit or a set of tests which allows to verify any publisher you created in order, uh, against the specification. So if you're going to look since I have this module, this is a plain jar, which you can include in your project. It, it, built, uh, it, it is built on top of uh, testng. I don't know why on top of testng, but it doesn't matter, it happened. Uh, but you should write all your tests then using testng. If you wanna combine test, your own test with, uh, for example, TCK's one, you have to use testng, but that's fine. So you have to include this module, and now in order to start using uh, test compatibility tools, tools uh, or kit provided uh, with this module, you have to extend your test and you have to say, I want to use publisher verification set. For example, you have to specify the type of your data, type of your data, and then you have to implement a few methods. But let's take a look first at our uh, publisher verification. First of all, this is abstract class which extends an interface which provides all kind of verification for all possible rules from the specification. If you're going to open, we will see lots of tests here. We can read, for example, validate max element from publisher, <coughs> bound depths, which means the same recursion test as we did before. The same subscription request must result in correct number of produced elements, back pressure verification, and so forth and so on. All kind of tests against all possible rules and cases in real specification. So it should sp simplify our life a lot because there is proper implementation and all we have to do in our, um, in our particular test case, we have to 
to just implement constructor. We have to provide proper environment in order to make uh, this test running in parallel, for example, if you want to uh, increase the speed of your test uh, verification. Then you have to provide two particular implementation of your publisher. If your publisher just work good, works good, you have to pro provide, for example, a publisher that returns a specific number of elements. In our case, this is fine because we can generate any uh, an array with any size. However, you have to, for some rules, you have to provide a file publisher, a publisher which just, which just emits an error signal. Since we don't have such one, uh, we, won't, we, can we can provide just null, and it, will, uh, it, it means for, for the TCK that this test or test related for failed publisher should be skipped. Does it make sense? In any case, all we have to do right now, we have to just run our test suite, and you will see lots of tests that checks all possible cases. So let's just check, check what failed. And if you're going to, to look at those tests, we will see that request negative number of elements is illegal. So this is what, uh, I guess, I got a question related whether it's possible to request minus one or zero. No, it's illegal. It's impossible. Uh, and your publisher, publisher should consider such subscriber as crazy one because it's kind of wrong mess and publisher uh, kind of subscriber math went in the wrong way. So we have to just throw an on error signal in order to stop iterating over existing data. Does it make sense? So we have to, to satisfy this rule. And to, in order to satisfy this rule, we have to just put a simple kind of condition here, like this. So we have, once we get a negative n, we have to just cancel our stream, and like this is absolutely correct. So we say, okay, we are canceled. This is the simplest way to stop iterating because everything could happen asynchronously, possibly. And uh, once we cancel subscri our subscription, nothing will happen if someone requests for a few more elements. And then we can send simply an error signal, right? This is the simplest solution we can ever create. Does it make sense? Now, if we are going to, to rerun our test suite, we will see that only one test is broken, which we wrote. So let me take a look at this guy. Maybe I've wrote something wrong. Right. I have to switch this. Um, th those guys in place, and now everything will be fine. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it won't give us. And, uh, this is exactly this is a good corner case. If you're if you're going to cancel, for example, if you're going to do something like this, cancel, you should expect anything if you request minus one because you have already canceled your subscription. You have already shown to your publisher that you are not ready, or you are done to receive any signals, and publisher shouldn't send anything. And that's why it's the simplest way to, 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 to stop, to prevent sending any elements again. Because if you're going to introduce another field, we will, would have to manage two fields. Once we enter the multi-threading, it will be really hard to, to, to manage two concurrent fields. That's why uh, as less concurrent fields we have, as much kind of, it's the, the more chance we have to, to make everything correct. All right, all good. So let's take a small break, 10 minutes, and then we are going, uh, we will turn back to, to our multi-threading implementation. Let's continue our session and let's, um, let's make a few, uh, kind of a short summary, first of all. What we have to, to, to make, to clarify on this picture, because you will see the same picture uh, on, the on the internet, and there is something incorrect in this picture. What do you think, what is incorrect here? Any idea? Like, can you see that communication is done between publisher and subscriber, yes? Uh, say it again? No, it's uh, like, the problem is not here. 
Do you see like the communication and data sending is happening on this picture from publisher side, right? But in fact, publisher do nothing related to data sending. And everything is hidden. The whole logic of data sending is hidden inside subscription. And subscription actually is importable, is, is uh, kind of um, responsible for data sending. This is important uh, thing that you have to remember. Because just imagine, you start debugging, for example, your publisher, your Flux publisher. And the first point uh, at which you are going to, to look and try to put a breakpoint is, of course, publisher methods, right? But it makes no sense because publisher isn't responsible for data sending. It's just responsible to make a subscriber to send a subscription, but the rest of the logic is happening inside subscription, inside request method. So once you start debugging any publisher, just put a breakpoint in request method. This is the important point of debugging all these reactive things. All right. What else? What you have to remember? The first pattern that you have to remember is work in progress pattern because it basically prevents you to, to overflow your, your stack by calling request on next, request on next. So it's important to, to use this pattern and you will see the same pattern everywhere in every implementation like RxJava2 uses the same, uh, the same patterns, Project Reactor uses the same patterns and you even can find the same pattern in Akka streams. So everything the same pattern. Implement it in this way, like we request some element, we put it in some field, then in, we increment the general number of uh, requested elements and check what, we, what, what was before. Then we have to use TCK whenever it's possible. Of course, you can create your own publisher with some specific logic, but just, um, just try to, to, to provide some first verification using TCK, it will show the, the, the incorrect behaviors, but of course you have to write your own test to kind of to cover everything and every behavior and uh, all behaviors of your of your publisher, particular publisher implementation. And in general, if you're going to sum up everything, it just works. The implementation kind of a little bit complex, but tests are passing, right? Should be all good. There is one problem here. GVM is related to multi-threading. And we are living in multi-threading environment. We are doing some processing in different threads. So it's important to consider that everything or anything can happen asynchronously. And we have to know what the specification sa says uh, about multi-threading, about um, asynchronity, asynchronity of data sending. And if you're going to, to look at the specification, we can find that Specification says that all method on your subscriber, including on next, on narrow, and on complete, should be called serialized. Mm -hmm. Who knows what serialized means? Yep, just, just try to explain in a few words. Okay, so let me do that. A stream of, yes, it's, it could be, it, it could be uh, explained as a stream of data, but from multi-threading perspective, it means that our method should be called only one by one without tracing on them. So it means that some synchronization should be implemented on top of your subscriber in, to, in order to satisfy this, uh, this requirement. So just imagine that two, that two threads couldn't, uh, is kind of, if you call on next method from two threads simultaneously, it's illegal, illegal behavior of your, of your publisher. This, sh this shouldn't happen in any case, and you have to preserve a particular synchronization in order to kind of order all calls one by one, so only one method at a time will be called, and not in parallel. Does it make sense? From kind of performance perspective, you, will, you, you can do some research, you can read some white paper, serialize a data processing, or data processing is in one thread is much more efficient than providing some uh, particular concurrent structures. It's kind of, uh, from time to time, it's much more performant than doing everything simultaneously uh, on, on some specific value and then try to synchronize every data, uh, kind of every element in some concurrent data structure. All right, what else? From the calling perspective or subscription perspective, request method should be called in non blocking fashion. What does it mean? If you called Request, it shouldn't be blocked. It could be blocked, like it's the worst case, but in, in, in a good case, it shouldn't, it shouldn't 
block your thread, so you have to just leave your requested number of elements and go to do your other job. This is for efficient again. And the most important part that cancel should be, must be, not shouldn't be, but must be non-block. Which means that if you want to release some resources, you want to call cancel asynchronously, and particular implementation of your subscription should release everything without blocking your thread because it could be long running operation. Just imagine that your subscription represents some running web server or web socket. And web socket connection could kind of could be or couldn't be closed really during the long period of time. So you have to assume that everything is long running and you have to close it asynchronously without blocking the caller thread. Does it make sense? Great. So let's try to implement multi-threading part. And first of all, I have to say that unfortunately, this case is not covered by TCK. You just have seen that our non-thread safe implementation passes all tests, right? Even though this is a, a kind of a correct official implementation of reactive streams TCK, it doesn't cover multi-threading case, unfortunately. Uh, what do you um, but why our implementation is not so safe? Let me show you. I have a test that checks our implementation against multi-threading. Of course, everything should be tests. In, in our case, I created a simple test, which call my request method on my subscription from a different threads. This is a way to verify whether uh, an implementation is, uh, is incorrect. Do you see it? So in this case, a few threads call and request method, so there is a high chance this, that the same field requested won't be the same for, for everyone. Like, it's, there is a really high chance that requested will be zero for, for free threads that uh, will bypass this quart and then we will get on next call it simultaneously from a few threads. That's why we have to make sure that our implementation is absolutely correct. So let me finalize this test. This test, okay, let me just use assertions again. Assert that my collected elements is exactly, contains exactly elements of this array. Contains exactly, yeah, like this. So, and if you're going to run this test, we will see that it won't be passed. Yeah, here we go. We requested for how many? For 5,000 of elements, but in our test we received only a few of them. As we can see, like this is actual result, 40 elements, but we expected much more. So of course we have to add maybe a little bit simpler verification, like this is size size has size, for example, 5,000 of elements, and it will simplify understanding of what's going on. So yeah, here we go. We expected 5,000 of elements, but got 18. It's clearly that something went wrong, and it's absolutely clear that implementation is non-thread safe, right? So how we can solve that problem? I guess the simplest solution here Simplest but incorrect is to put synchronize, right? Have you ever heard about synchronize before? Yeah, so this is the simplest way to make a particular call or particular method synchronized. And if you're going to run this test, we will see that, of course, it will be passed. But in case of such multi-threading invocation, one of the threads will be blocked, which is not good for us, right? And not efficient in multi-threading invocation. So. The best case is to find out some non-blocking algorithm, algor algorithm for, uh, for data sending here. Any idea? It will make our implementation much more complex. Let's, take an, like, let's try to anal analyze what, what, kind of, what we can do. Of course, the simplest from my point of view is to make, first of all, every, every parameter here volatile, because we can. And for those who don't know what volatile, volatile means, volatile allows you to, it's additional instru instruction for your uh, kind of compiler that uh, compiles all the code, and this uh, provides additional instruction which does uh, some 
um, inter-process synchronization of uh, all the fields. So it writes uh, the data into field directly to shared memory in a few words. So if you're going to run this test, we will still see that the test won't be passed, even so we have kind of synchroni uh, proper synchronization of, on, on the fields it itself. So what's wrong here? I guess if you're going to, to listen to IDE, we will see that there is non-atomic operation happens on volatile field. What does it mean? In general, we should expect that this field or, or this increment kind of field increment, uh, incrementation or um, increase of, in the size happens from the few threads. But in fact, this uh, increment could be rewritten, for example, like this, not like this, but basically like initial requested plus initial requested plus n. So it basically, in fact, plus n equal, so iteration kind of shorter um, option of writing increment for a field, is in fact the same as we put some field in the field, kind of the state in the field, and then use the state in order to increment the size of the field, store it in, in, in the, for example, in the class. And this is two separate independent operation, and if we have some racing, one thread can read previous state and then write previous state plus new value. So a few threads can simultaneously write some absolutely non-synchronized uh, results. And this is not good. So how we can fix it? Any idea? Uh, say it again. Right. So the simplest case is to, instead of using volatile, we can use some proper atomic of wrappers or data structures, call it atomic integer or atomic boolean or atomic long. So let me quickly quickly replace this implementation with some prepared one because I don't want to write everything um, here. So I'm just introduce the same implementation, but with atomic primitives. Have you ever seen such primitives before or used before? Who used them? Okay, just. A few few hands, but for those who have never used, I'm recommending to to try them. It's pretty good to figure out how they work. So what's wrong with that? Okay, I missed one. Closing um, figure. So what's going on here? Basically, it's the same implementation, which is which relies on some atomic kind of increment of the requested field. This is guaranteed to happen atomically uh, by the GVM. And then we use, we can write this in the same way here, like set zero as it was before, right? Does it make sense? So I guess we should expect the, the test passed, right? Who votes that the test will be passed? Okay, just one hand, two, three hand. Okay, four people, the rest. Who votes who vote that the test won't be, won't be passed? Okay, I will ask you and you and you why. Uh, say it again. Why? Okay, this is a good point. That's why in the previous synchronous implementation I wrote it as minus cent, right? I rewrote it like here we send n elements, like we for sure iterated n time, and now we can decrement the specific number of elements we set in particular, right? So will be test pass it or not right now after those changes? Okay. Who votes against the, the test passing? Okay, it's the same one person. I will ask you why later, but let's run it and let's figure out whether it works or not, and whether this refactoring fixed it. So it's running, and again, test failed. They expected 5,000, but get now a little bit more, but still not yet there. So what, what, what went wrong? Any idea? Uh, yeah, we can. Right, this is the previous implementation uh, says it, yeah, in this way, but let's run it again. 
Good point. Good catch up. But anyways, the test is not passed. Why? Any idea? Yeah, please. Why? Just imagine for static for, for publisher. Like we, we got a subscriber and in, in our implementation we sends methods, uh, sends elements, sends this, the whole array to particular subscribers that requested. Just imagine that we got, for example, tens of subscribers. We have to manage kind of for all of them their back pressure control and we can't send uh, the same elements to everyone or say kind of increment uh, the same static field from, from every subscriber because it will be a shared field. Yes. So the next is not necessarily being called the serializer, right? It stores the object in a array. List, all the elements here, so it's final. So it will be synchronized once we exit the. Um, again. So if you're going to read the good catch up, so the question is related, we, what kind of will be the collection, non-synchronized kind of non-synchronized collection, uh, be properly used in this place, in this test, right? That was the question. It would be okay to use that if your next was called Serialized. And we have this kind of um, rule from specification that the on next and on any method should be called in serialized way, and if you are going to read what serialized mean from the specification perspective, you will see happens before. You will see proper kind of non-simultaneous invocation of the methods, and happens before basically means that everything will be serialized, and we will have proper memory uh, refreshing, and all the data will be in place. So from the from this usage of non-synchronized collection, it's fine in the test. We have this guarantee, I will show you. So since we are using here proper atomic implementation and proper increment, even though we have a racing on this field, we have a proper guarantee that initial requested here will be uh, kind of, since we use using get and add, so we have a guarantee that the previous value will be returned before we add anything. And we have a guarantee that everything happens in order. So even so we have a, Erasing the proper previous value will be observed for a particular thread. So one of, the, of them will observe zero, so this thread will win the racing on this, on, on this volatile field, so it's, it will start iterating, but another will see kind of uh, what happened before that. The problem is in a different place. Let me show you that case. And since this is a really complex multi-threading um, racing on some, on, on some on kind of on some particular field, I'm going to, to show them on, on slides instead of debugging. So now we are going to kind of debug everything on slides and consider some corner cases which is happening in uh, high concurrent environment. So just imagine that one of the threads entered this execution. This is thread black. We, c we will call it black one. Right? Is it clear? Good. So this guy uh, incremented the requested field it reached, for example, it requested for five elements, so now requested global field is equal to five. Initial requested was zero because nobody iterating in, in for loop. So we can just enter the critical execution or sending a part of our logic and start sending data. So far, so good. Yeah? Then just imagine the case that there is another thread, which is we just enter which has just entered the, the request method. Read, try to read the request field, but at the same time we just finalized our execution in thread black. And now two threads trying to increment and decrement requested field, global requested field, right? So in, in good case, in case everything is pretty fine, the black thread will be faster than the red one, so it will win the racing, it will decrement the requested field on the exact amount of uh, sent elements, right? And it will just exit execution. Then the red, the red thread will be just a loser one, so because he lost, kind of, he lose uh, the racing, so it will read. 
afterwards the field, the state of the field requested, it will be zero, it will increment this field on five elements, and then start iterating. But just imagine the case that black one is loser one, right? So everything can happen. And just imagine the case that the red one is faster, so it will increment the requested field faster than black one. And it will see that initial requested, or the previous state of initial requested field is five, so which means uh, with regard to our logic that we have to exit execution. But at the same time, the black thread just simply decrement on five elements because it sent only five elements and will also exit the execution. So both threads will exit execution and we will get this situation of fire because we requested for five elements but nothing will happen because both threads just exited, right? So this is the main case and this is the main problem which is happening in our code, in, in our solution. And the main problem is hidden here because we don't have any checks which looks at the previous state like this and checks whether the previous state is higher than zero because kind of this is racing and this field uh, related, this is basically a point of racing. So we have to consider that at the same time someone can increment this field while we're decrementing it, right? So what we have to do, we have to, to write something like if previous state is not equal to zero, we have to re kind of repeat our execution. Otherwise, we have to just return it, right? This is basically what we have to do. And now we have to, to repeat, to, to, to go to the beginning and repeat everything. So how we can do that? How we repeat some action? Right. Of course, if we will be in, for example, C Sharp or Visual Basic or whatever language that support Go to, we will be able to use Go to particular line and yeah, solve this um, this problem in a different way. But in Java, we don't have such keywords, so the simplest solution will be just to say, okay, let's try to write a while loop. So we want to iterate until the end of time. And we want to repeat everything in case the previous state is higher than zero, which means that there is a racing and someone requested for some data. And we have to just reset the send field to zero and start from, from the beginning. Does it make sense? It's not clear what's going on. Okay. <laughs> Basically, in this case, I, I, it would be really hard to debug and show this, this particular case, but let's just uh, go through, walk through the code. So you started execution. So you enter it the, this, this method. You check it that this field is equal to zero. You started sending data here. You enter it while loop, while true loop, and you started sending data. Then you exited data sending, you started kind of bypassing all these checks, and you reach this point, right? So you, you are trying to decrement uh, requested value exactly on the amount of sent elements. In one case, the decrement will be equal to zero. The previous state equal to zero. Oh, yeah, I have to change this to equal to zero. In case the previous state is equal to zero, that it means that uh, you send all, kind of, you satisfied the demand from the subscriber. So subscriber requested 10 elements and you exactly send 10 elements which is specified in the send field, right? So in case you satisfied the requirement from the subscriber, you're absolutely free to exit the execution. However, th we are living in multi-threading environment and as I have shown on the slides, another thread can increment the same field at the same time because we just send an element and, for example, we executed some asynchronous process in, in the on next method and then we requested for a few more elements. This could, hap this could happen and we have to be prepared to, to such case. So we can reach some racing on this field and one guy, as I shown on the slides, can increment requested fi faster than we decremented, right? So in such case, we can get previews, for example. 
state equal to, for example, 10 or more. It depends on how many elements were requested just a moment ago during the racing. So it means that the current state of global requested number is higher than zero, and the guy who's requested or who's decremented this field will see initial requested higher than zero, so it will just exit the execution. And we have, instead of doing kind of, instead of just exiting the thread, we have to repeat the work. We have to steal work from the previous thread and do it for, for him. Is it clear right now? Okay. Yeah, because we, the index is changing all the time. We just increment an index all the time, increment and incre incrementing it on every iteration, but we decrement uh, the re global state only once during the exit from iteration. Yep. Yeah, this pattern basically call it work stealing. This, by, by it works stealing, because there is a few threads which is non-blockingly increment one state, atomically increment one state, and only one is allowed to send the data because of the specification. We can't allow parallel or simultaneous kind of on next invocation, so we have to preserve serialized invocation by only applying one thread for data sending. Okay, I guess this is clear. You can do it in whatever fashion you want. If you're going to look in, in Project Reactor, they are, they are using, for example, Infinite uh, for, for loop like this in order to implement the same. Like, it's just a matter of, of style of, of, of your code. In, under the hood, during the runtime, it will be in, in line in an absolutely different way. So it's up to kind of Git, uh, up, up to JIT kind of Java JIT, JIT uh, compiler, just in time compiler. All right. So, yep. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, say it again. Yep. Okay. You mean that, that one point? Okay. No. We, like, do you mean, like, what happens in case someone... Um, Two threads invo invokes kind of this the request method, right? Yeah. So we have this guard here, this this kind of work in progress, which will which will guarantee that only one thread or, or only one worker will be iterating here. Uh, two line of. Okay, let's do it in the following way. Let's try to discuss it after, after a break in order to, to, to make some progress. Yeah. All right, so let's move forward and let's go to, to the slides and let's discuss what happened basically. In order, like, tr let's try to summarize. In general, in order to provide efficient non-blocking implementation of, uh, of, our uh, of our subscription and our publisher, we have to use atomic fields so this is a well-known way to, to provide some non-blocking um, behaviors in, and thread-safe behaviors in a multi-threading environment in Java. Then we have to use, we have to combine work in progress plus infinite loop in order to avoid tracing on our requested field and in general in data send, uh, in data send critical point. And this is basically, this combination is called work stealing. In addition, we have to use, um, yeah, we have to run all the tests again, right? I forgot one point. We just uh, make, made one method correct, so we just verified whether it's running correctly, but we still have the whole TCK. So we have to run the whole TCK against our implementation and see whether it works correctly or not. So let's take a look. 
again, something went wrong here. I will be back to that later. But now we have one test which is just running. And if we are going to wait for a few more minutes, this, tail, this test will still be running. Why? So in order to understand why, we have to take a look at the test. We have to read what this specific rule says. And if you're going to, to look at, the, the, at this kind of, and the test, um, it says, OK, just imagine the case when subscrip your, sub uh, your subscriber requests for one element and then requests for long max value minus one. So it basically will be long max value, but after, it could request for a few more elements. So if you're going to look at the test itself, we will see that the initial request here is integer max value. Once we requested integer max value, we request for long max value minus one. So now the question, what will happen if we reach on long max, on kind of on long, uh, on long field, some request uh, equal to something like this, integer max value plus long max value in general, to simplify the case, what, the case, what will happen? Right, it will overflow and we will get minus requested. Like the requested state will be minus something. And unfortunately, the default atomic long does not prevent us, does not prevent or handle this case. Because this is just a simple, like it can fall back to the simple while loop, the same racing. We just use compare and swap in order to, in swap in order to make sure the state and the memory is the same, is the same as it was before. So this is one of the pattern, like, uh, uh, like non-blocking uh, loop with compare and swap in order to, to make some operation atomic. And unfortunately, there is nothing related to checking of the overflow. So we have to basically somehow implement something similar, identical to, to what's happened here, but with some additional checks like whether the field is overflowed or not, right? So the simplest way is just to copy paste this guy and put it here instead of, of this certain implementation. So we have to use, of course, this requested, our requested field. We have to use get because this is a little bit complex implementation with regard of, uh, of what's going on um, inside atomic, uh, inside particular atomic in long implementation. But in general, we will end up, I will try to cheat a little bit, we will end up with something like this. So we will create the same do while loop, which will use the same compare and set or compare and swap under the hood in atomic long. But in between, we will introduce some few more uh, check-in. The first check-in is whether initial is already long max value, because it could happen. Someone, uh, someone put uh, long max value into, this val uh, into the request field, so the next thread which is trying to increment this field will see long max value, so it means that there is nothing to increment here, we have to just exit the execution. We reach the maximum value of, of long, right? In case it's not equal to long max value, we have to, to make proper sum of the, of, of, of the states, and in case the state is overflowed, the end will be minus something. So we will just put long max value into the current state, and we will try to, to atomically put this field into the memory. Is it clear how it works? This is a proper. Um, say it again. Right. Yeah, this is absolutely correct. If you're going to look at the specification, and if you're trying to, to, to look at what is related, not here, but uh, to long max value, we will see the rule number 17 in the specification in the subscription section, and we will see that long max value could be considered as unbounded request. So the publisher is absolutely fine to send all this data because sending of long max value elements will take two, 292 years of, on one computer. So it doesn't make any sense to, to, to have some more complex 
kind of data structure to handle more than lone Maxwellian, we can simply consider this as, as an unbounded request because no one production is even more than this kind of this time. Does it make sense? Great. So uh, we have to fix our solution in this way, and now if you're going to rerun uh, the whole test suite, you will see that all tests will be passed except this one. So we have to look what's going on here. What's wrong there? Yeah, because I called cancel. That's why it, 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 it wasn't passed. But in general, if you're going to run the test suite, test suite again, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I changed this and forgot about fix. <clears throat> again, all right. So let's just, let's just keep this strange test because, yeah, it's doing something wrong. And let's move forward. Oh, yeah, right. I, don't, I have to request five elements in, instead of one. And then it will be fine. Yeah, all good. Right. So let's go back to, to the slides again. We have to implement our own get and add instead of using a kind of built-in one because of the overflowing. So we have to handle this case. And in general, if you're going to summarize, we will see that everything wor works right now in multi-threading environment. Uh, the code is much more complicated. That's why we started with the simplest non-thread safe implementation, right? Because I if we try to handle everything, it, 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 it's at the same time, we won't understand anything that's clear. And now we have to optimize it. It works. It works fine. It works absolutely correct from the reactive stream specification perspective, but it's slow. Why it's slow? We have to consider what kind of optimization we can apply. So first of all, uh, from the kind of general uh, optimization science, if there is one, we can optimize some field access if it's possible because we have a few more atomic uh, kind of uh, primitives here. Maybe it's, it doesn't necessary to have uh, atomic or volatile access to all of them. Then we have some, yeah. Then we have some few more produced objects, and if you know, the more objects we produce to, to our uh, garbage collector, the more work we it have to handle afterwards. Because we are living in Java. Java has garbage collector, which is handled asynchronously or, or synchro synchronously at some point in, and, and at some point in time all the bo objects in the memory. So it have to clean all the trash we produced. And this is of course some resources of the computer, which means that we have to wait some time in order it will be cleaned. So it decreases in throughput as well and it, in latency. And possibly we have to improve execution pass because, you know, in some modern processors there is some slow, fast pass where a processor can do some aggressive kind of optimization with regard to the state of execution. So we have to consider some possible execution pass optimizations as well. And, yeah, this is important to JMush everything because uh, we won't figure out whether we did some optimizations or not. So we have to use Java, Java uh, memory, uh, not Java memory, but Java micro benchmarks. Have you ever heard about JMH? Yeah, a few hands. So this is a tool built in in JDK right today. And it allows us to, to run a proper benchmark against our uh, implementation. And this will be proper micro benchmark, which allows us to, to handle all possible case, cases like cache and line in, and so forth and so on, which will happen in, in real runtime. So in order to start using GMI, GMH, we have to, to bring to dependencies. Starting from JDK 12, this is a built-in part of the open JDK, but we're still using JDK uh, 8, so we have to, to bring them as a dependencies. Then we have a few more tests here. We have a module GMH which has a proper performance test, which is basically tries to run uh, our implementation, our proper optimized implementation against old one. So I have an old one implementation here. I have to uncommand it, of course. Come on, not here, but yeah, I have to uncommand this part. Uh, again. Yeah, and here is old one implementation, which in current state is absolutely identical to what we have in Array Publisher, right? So now we are going to apply a few optimizations 
on our array publisher, and then we are going to run this performance test in order to figure out whether we reached uh, better performance or not. Does it make sense? Any questions related to, to performance? So this is a really, really, really simple performance we create to, uh, to pub publishers with the same kind of, with the same uh, number of elements in it. And then we run the same test, which is basically calling subscribe method and wait, waiting for the end of the stream. Yeah, if you're going to look at our performance subscriber, th it basically has, um, it requests for a few more elements every time and uh, we expect that we get all of them. So good, so far so good. Any questions related to the test? Okay, let's move forward. And now let's try to, to apply some optimizations. Now we have to question ourselves whether we need atomic primitives on all of the fields. Do we need them? Okay, let's start with the simplest. Do we need atomic boolean on cancelled field? If you're going to look at the implementation, we see that cancelled is just set once at the cancel method to true, and in the rest of the places, it, just, it is just a read of this, uh, of this atomic boolean. So do we have to use it as uh, atomic boolean Basically, we can just make it volatile because, yeah, cancel can happen in any thread, so we have to, to expect some asynchronous invocation, some multi-threading invocation, but in general, we don't have to, to do any other um, kind of, uh, we don't have to, to do any atomic operation on it, right? So that's fine. So we have to just simply simplify this guy Simplifies this guy a little bit as well. And we have to write something like this. All right, so all good. What else? We simplify it, we reduced one object. It will improve our performance a little bit in case we have a short stream, like a stream of few elements. Because we produced less object to garbage collector, which means that uh, garbage collector will be required to clean up less objects. Okay, now I have to question you. Do we have to, 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 to have atomic integer on index field here? Let's take a look at our implementation. We have a guarantee here that all invocation on, on next method is happened by one thread, right? So it's ha uh, those invocation uh, are happening s kind of seriali in serialized way. Where is that? Where is that? I don't see my 4.0, oh, here we go. So all invocation on this, on next, happens by in serialized, in serialized way, which means that only one thread iterating over this section, which means that only one thread increment this field, right? There is no other access outside of this for loop. So which means that there is no access here to index, which means that only one thread enter this invocation, and once this thread is exit, there is no other interaction with this field. So the question again, do we need any atomic operation on this field? In fact, we don't need. If you're going to read this, uh, the Java memory model specification, we will see that we can safely mark this field as just plain uh, field of the class without any additional volatiles um, keywords on it because before the write to this field because because before of uh, read kind of before of uh, enter this section we have a proper happens before uh, kind of border or guard which is happening here so we basically read atomically read from write read and write from uh, from the request field, and then we do some write to this field afterwards, which means that any thread which enter this execution will be able to to get the same state as it was before uh, another thread write to requested field. Yeah, I'm I'm going to share the link to Java memory model section related to this field uh, to to this part, but this is basically a partial ordering of um, uh, of instruction or of the kind of data processing or called processing. And in general, um, 
we, in case there is no racing on this field, we can safely assume that kind of GVM propagate or provide us with uh, up-to-date value of index. So basically, again, we read from this field, which invokes happens before condition, and we write, again, which guarantee that everything uh, will be, again, visible to any thread, which will read from the same field. A little bit complex, but yeah, I'm going to share some links so you'll be able to, to read what's going on afterwards. Now, what else? Do we need to, to read every time from this requested field here? Just imagine the case, case again. Someone entered the, the execution here. Uh, what's going on? I guess I bro broke something. Yeah. So someone, only one thread entered this field, which means the current requested number is equal to basically to what was requested in N, right? So one thread, the first one thread invokes request method, for example, it says I want a 100 of elements, then it bypasses all this verification, which means this is the only thread, and then it starts iterating on over this field. So it means that at this point, at the first invocation point, the N will represent the current state of uh, kind of the, the total number of requested elements, right? Yeah, question. Yeah, we will move forward to, to, the, to that point. Now we just send all the requested elements and we reach that point. In some case, previous state will be zero, which means that nobody requested more elements, that the end was just an actual requested number or the total number, number of requested elements. In case the previous state is higher, then zero, it means that someone requested and we have to update the previous state. So we have to basically modify and to, to the previous state. Of course, it's a little bit incorrect because we are modifying uh, the parameter here, so we have to move uh, the current, kind of the current, current requested to some additional field like this, and then we have to update this field in this way. We don't have to create another, we have to just use this one. And that's it. Does it make sense? All right. So let's move forward. Let's take a look at what, what is left. We have one more object here, and we have a few more kind of field access here. So basically, if you're going to run uh, previous implementation against this one. That's what I'm going to do right now. So I'm just going to run this test. We will see that the performance result will be much higher of the optimized implementation compared to the previous one. So we will have a few, kind of a few seconds. This is improper test because we have to, to do a proper number of iteration for warm up. We have to do a much more iteration sessions for measurement. This is just for demo purpose. At home, you have to run, for example, 10 warm-up iteration and 10, for example, measurement iteration in order to reach proper inlining numbers and proper, I don't know, uh, all possible implementations that just-in-time compiler can apply to our code. But even though, if you're going to wait a little bit, we will see maybe 30 or 40% win in performance. So let's wait. During this time, you are more than welcome to ask some questions. Any questions? Uh, say it again. Uh, just a sec. Let me double check that. So you says that I forgot to change. Okay, where is our array publisher? Array publisher. So I have to. I forgot to change something there. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Current requested. Thank you. So I have to run this guy again. All right. Any other questions? No? Not that far? So far, so good. Anything is clear? Why it's done in this way? All right. So let's wait a little bit. And in general, 
Uh, for those who are curious, I have at GitHub the, the proper numbers with the proper number of iterations. So you can uh, Google for reactive hardcore. There is a link for all the sources here. And by doing just a few of those optimizations, we will get, I will show you, we can get about, where is that? Uh, yeah, optimized implementation, yeah. Here we go. We can get about 30% win. So the array publisher, which is optimized implementation, will have about 84 uh, iterations per second for one, uh, for one million of elements where the old one will have only 63 or so. So it's, it will be about 30% or 32% win in performance but by just applying all of this uh, simple optimization, etc. So let's take a look. Yeah, it's not that good because we have not that many iterations, but it's clear that uh, anyways, the publisher performance is higher than uh, un unoptimized publisher. So we can, but you can see that the error is much higher than uh, for unoptimized one, which means that kind of the, the bound of proper value is a little bit uh, improper and we have to run much more iterations in order to get proper value. The less error, the better result, the better measurement. All right, afterwards we can apply a few more, uh, a few more optimizations. I have to, to <clears throat> roll back to some particular point in order to decrease, uh, to make a little bit faster everything. So let me just switch to particular commit. And what we can do afterward, in, in order to decrease number of created objects, we can apply some more advanced uh, atomic long field updaters. So instead of using a particular object per subscription, we can cr use, for example, volatile, one volatile field per subscription, which is primitive one, and we can create some particular kind of updater which knows in particular which is which on which class it created. So it knows what is the offset to, to that particular requested field or in your class, in your memory, and then it can manage it in the same way without creation an additional wrapper atomic uh, around your, uh, your primitive value, which means that you can decrease one more object for your memory. Have you ever heard about atomic long field updater? So just take a look. This is a much better way of doing the same actions on volatile fields without creation an object. Then a uh, few more optimization is, of course, to move everything into the stack. This is what happened. Uh, this is what happened here. So all possible access to my variable I put to to the stack because access to the stack pro produces less instruction to the to to the to the CPU to your processor. So which means the less uh, number of instruction you produce, the more faster uh, your code will be, right? So this is another optimization you can apply in any case to to get a few more percent percent of uh, of performance. And finally, the final optimization is related to slow and fast pass. That's what I basically mentioned at the beginning. So as you can remember, specification says that long max value could be considered as an unbounded request, which means that we don't have to, to manage, in case of unbound request, any decrements on request field, right? Someone requested everything from our publishers, and we have to just send all, of, all elements we have uh, through to, to that subscriber, right? So in that case, we don't have decrement requested field. We don't have to apply any atomic writes. And we can simplify our implementation to just plain for a loop, and that's it, without additional while true. And the slow past is, is left this in the same way. It's working as previous, as before. So now if you're going to run, again, test, we will win a few more percent, which is good for us in terms of performance. And now the most important part if you're going to look at Flux, at, at real library, for example, at Project Reactor, so if you're going to, to look at Flux Array, let's just split, uh, split our environment, not horizontally, but I wanted to split vertical, yep, like this. And if you're going to walk through the code, we will see that our implementation is absolutely identical to uh, to what we have in real libraries. So here is Flux Array from Project Reactor. 
So this is Spring Reactor, another name. And here is our own implementation of Array Publisher. Here we have the same setup, the same way of kind of handling subscribe uh, call. Reactor 1 is a little bit more complex because there is a few more cases of, for optimization, but in general it says Array Subscription. Now if we are going to look at Array Subscription, we will see somewhat identical. We have the same number of fields. We have the same kind of subscriber or actual subscriber to whom we have to deliver or, uh, our elements. We have an array. We have an index, which is not non-volatile one because of the same memory warranty, Java memory model guarantees. We have the same way of handling or dec decreasing number of created objects by using atomic long field updater. In Rx Java 2, you can find that uh, array subscription extends atomic long, which is another way to decrease number of created objects, which is absolutely fine. So you can, e you can either use atomic long field updater, or in case you are still using Java 6, you can extend uh, atomic long and uh, ma made it, make it part of your subscription or of your class. And then the implementation is absolutely identical. There is a few more kind of optimization from the code perspective, like instead of putting every, put everything in one, in one method, there is uh, the same verification but hidden in some utilities methods, like verification whether n is less than, than zero. The same way of doing atomic uh, increment of the field without overflow. So this is basically the same as written here. Like we are doing the same infinite loop this colon, compare, and set, and in set, in, inside another add cap, we have the same verification whether overflow happens or not. Identical one. And afterwards, we have the same fast or slow pass execution with regards of what were requested from us. And here we go. We have identical execution. Like if you're, com if you're going to compare fast pass, we will see the same. The same execution, the only difference is just they use for loop, we are using a while loop in order to, 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 to prevent tracing. They, they use while loop in order to send data, we use for loop. That's the only difference. But in general, the implementation are identical. Do you agree? Great. So let's go to, to and sum up the first, the, the first part of our uh, session. So we have to always use GMIH in order to figure out whether we made a proper performance improvement. Then we have to read Java memory models, memory model specification, because sometimes it says that some synchronization or multi-threading warranties uh, is done by, for example, previous atomics, and we don't, we don't have to create new atomic or volatile fields, and we can just rely on only one. For example, in this case, this is part of our code, uh, there is a warranty that this field will be executed only by one thread because of this. And we have happens before guarantees because of volatile read and write to requested field. And there is a kind of guard which prevent tracing. So we have a guarantee that all increments on index field will happen only by one thread, and all threads will have proper access to the latest state of the index field. So we don't have to make it volatile or create some atomic uh, integer wrapper around it, right? Um, we have to reduce number of produced trash in order to save the world, in order to save our applications from stop the worlds. And the, the fewer objects we produce, the less often uh, garbage collector tries to collect some trash or garbage, and we have higher performance or, and more resources for our business logic. Then we have to store everything in the stack because you can read this, um, this kind of topic on Stack Overflow, discussion on Stack Overflow about local access, like stock st stack local access or, or access in stack to, to variables versus access to, for example, fields in your class. And finally, you have to carefully learn the specification, like reactive stream specification, in order to find some cases like this, which says that if you request a long max value, you can just push unbounded amount of elements, and you can simplify your execution path a little bit more. Finally, 
we got successful optimization. Our code is equal to Project Reactor, which means that now you know how Project Reactor works. In kind of most of the cases, the code will be absolutely identical. Even so, you will try to iterate over iterable, you will see the same. You would have to, to work absolutely with the same implementation. You will see the same patterns as in RE implementation. And in general, whatever structure you will see, you will see the same patterns like work in progress, infinite loop, and so forth and so on. To remind you, work in progress, one of the most used patterns in Project Reactor and Rx Java 2. Infinite loop for work stealing and the same infinite loop for um, proper atomic increment on the requested field without overflow. Then fast slow pass in order to just more make your uh, code more optimized and more, uh, but to make better performance for your uh, publisher. And finally, Atomics XX field updater in order to decrease the number of created objects and achieve the same behaviors as with atomic long or integer or whatever atomic primitive. Finally, to summarize first part, don't afraid the kind of the implementation of your own publisher and reactive streams in general, just read specification. Everything is done for performance, and everything you will see in Project Reactor or RxJava is, is done uh, in order to make your code better, kind of more performant, but now you know how it, uh, how it works. You have to, to take a look at the TCK, because TCK simplifies your life uh, against verification in order to verify particular implementation of your publisher. And in general, wash your hand after govna code, which means literally from Russian, uh, wash your hand after shitty code, because this was a really complex solution. It's much better to work with functional, uh, functional style and functional DSL, which allows you to just write your actions without uh, looking into the particular complex implementation. All right, let's make five minutes break, and we are going to dig deeper into operators, and now we are going to implement a little bit more. Do you need some break? No, you don't? Okay, then let's just um, let's dig deeper and let's try to finalize proper library because we just created a beginning of our stream, but we have to implement the rest of the things, right? We have to achieve the proper Rx kind of library. So we are not going to, to take a look at the order, proce order processing. This is a wrong slides here. So let's just skip them, my bad. I suppose I collapsed them, but in general, what we're going to implement now for our, uh, for our library is this set of operators. The first, true, the first three of uh, them is really simple. They are just do mapping, filtering, or we just want to get only n number of elements from our stream, th uh, our stream or our publisher. Uh, the final one is really hard, and I'm not sure we will have enough time, but for those who are curious, I will be able to, to show how to implement the same publish on operator, which allows us to execute one part of our, uh, for example, pipeline on one thread and another pipe on uh, part of the pipeline on the different thread or, or another thread. So kind of parallelize our execution using the same kind of array publisher implementation, for example, without changing anything. You will see that the patterns are the same. And in order to start implementing, we have to dig a little bit deeper into understanding the life cycle of reactive streams. So what you have to know about life cycle, that first step, or first action we'd ever do with reactive streams, we create a publisher or beginning of the stream, right? Then we write some actions, some map, another map, filter, whatever. And what we are going to do at this point, we just assemble our pipeline. There is no data so far because it could be dynamic publisher from WebSocket. Um, we can probably just add pipes or steps to our execution process without having any data, right? So this is assembling or uh, wiring our pipeline together. This is just a way of where data will be going through. Then the next step is, of course, calling the subscribe method. That's what's happening afterwards. We are ready to receive some data from our publisher, from our source. So in that case, we send a subscriber to our publisher. We call subscribe, and the publisher receives a proper subscriber. And as, 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 and, and as a result, 
uh, publisher calls on subscribe on the subscriber method, right? This is our order of the, of the execution. And subscriber literally receives the subscription, so this happens, the first exchange, and in reactive streams it's called like subscription time, or subscription or uh, subscriber versus subscription exchange. There is no data still, but this is just the first interaction between, uh, between publisher and subscriber. Afterwards, once we receive the subscription, we request data because we have uh, back pressure control and we have to say, okay, I want to receive five elements, please publisher send me five elements and publisher will send exactly five elements applying all the transformation on the pass. And for example, if it has only one element, it will call afterwards on complete and that's it. And this, this phase is called runtime because at this point in time we receive all the elements and this is basically the proper data processing or runtime. Does it make sense? All right. So if it's clear, we have to summarize the three, three phases. The first one is assembling. We just gather together all the kind of stage of data processing. Then we do subscription in order to exchange subscriber versus subscription. And finally, we have a runtime at which we call request and receive on next, and then we call request and so forth and so on. So now, let's try to think how to implement map operator. At which phase? Uh, at which point in time all the transformation happens. We learned that there is assembly or ass assembling time or assembly, there is subscription and there is runtime. During runtime, right? So it basically during runtime we called subscriber, we did proper data exchange and now we called element. This element made all transformation, kind of our mapper made all proper, make all, all proper, proper transformation. And now how to implement that? Where ha we have to put our business logic of applying some Lambda, for example, inside Mapper. Any idea? Where we call, on whom we kind of call uh, on next method? On subscriber, right? We have subscriber here. So basically we have maybe put our business logic inside subscriber and somehow chain all of those subscribers together. Yeah, does it make sense? So it basically will be something like that. We will create some map subscriber, and during the invocation, one subscriber should be wrapped to another, and another subscriber should be wrapped to another in order to make the chain of the invocation, right? So it's basically, I would, will call this pattern as Matryoshka pattern, or Russian doll, Russian doll, um, Pattern because basically we have to wrap one subscriber into another subscriber into another subscriber, and on this picture, our actual subscriber where we expect data is at the very kind of middle of this, uh, of this chain. So let's try to implement the simplest uh, map operator or the simplest subscriber and figure out uh, whether it's enough or not to make it. So let me switch to another point. Uh, of my commit history. So, where is that? I wanted to switch here. Okay, yeah, that's proper. So we have test application here, at which we are going to apply afterwards all the, all the uh, kind of all the reactive methods and all reactive maps. And we are going to basically replace, replace this imperative mapping using our reactive mapping. That's clear. To, to this point, we will be back after the simplest, um, the simplest uh, refactoring or implementation. And now we have to create map subscriber, right? Because we saw that everything happens inside subscriber. So we have to create map subscriber. We have to extend this class from subscriber subscriber, yes, I want this subscriber. We have to put a little bit of generic types like uh, in and out because one input type we get, then we have to apply it mapping and we have to, to send the result of, of the mapping which is the out type. So our subscriber should be specified as an, as an out, top, out type, generic type. Yeah, we have to now implement all three methods 
And basically, we have to have some function which allows us to map one into another, right? So we have to create function, use, for example, function which accept some in and return some output. And this will be our mapper. So we have to expect this guy in our, from our constructor to be given here. And now we have to apply, oh no, now yeah, this should be input type, right? This should be input type instead of output, and we have to, to apply our in in order to get some result out, right? Now the question to whom we have to send. So we have to have here our actual subscriber, right, as on this picture. This is a whole chain of, of subscribers, but our actual is at the very end. So for this guy, the actual subscriber will be this one, and for this guy, for this subscriber, the actual subscriber will be this, and so forth and so on. So we have to put, for example, subscriber, which in this case should be typed as out, or should kind of accept any kind of out type, and this will be actual subscriber. We have to expect that it as well as a part of our uh, construction. Actual, right, to all subscriber. And then we have to send this result over on next to our subscriber, right? Simply. Any, any questions so far? This is really simple, just plain decoration of one into another in order to add some behaviors. Now we have to take a look at our application and try to refactor our service class, which allows us to accept some record and then produce another record. So in order to make this guy reactive, basically we have to maybe do something like this. We have to define some public method, which I guess should, which basically should um, return publisher, I guess, of this type. Let's call this process as well. And in many cases, if you're you going to write our business logic, we expect that some, someone just provide us a particular publisher as well, right? So we accept publisher and return publisher. Yep, does it make sense? So we accept publisher of type order, order publisher, order request publisher, and now we have to apply somehow some, um, some changes, or we have to somehow chain the mapping during our data stream. So we have to apply this mapping, we have to apply this mapping, we have to apply this mapping. So in order to apply all of this mapping, we have to create map subscribers, right? We have to create map subscribers, which basically do some, for example, apply some function. So we can take this and use it as method reference or convert it to function. And call to currency grabbed to currency order. It doesn't matter what, what's going on under the hood, but we can just use uh, this mapping, which is basically applying, converting one result into another literally, and use it as a function. But we have to pass another kind of another parameter to our subscriber, which is actual subscriber. But do we have, at this point in time, actual subscriber? No, we don't, right? So where we can access to, to, to the subscriber in, in the chain? Inside publisher, right? Publisher provides us with, with the subscriber. So maybe we have to do something like this. We have to create a publisher like this, let's just write some, um, some less clear code. And we have to chain it somehow with what we have is this guy. So we have access to upstream, right, to the previous publisher. We got this publisher we called subscriber. And we have to pass created map new, newer map subscriber to our actual publisher, right? In order to chain everything. So 
just imagine that we returned this guy here, just in case, just make it uh, unclear type, let's just make it raw type. And in this case, let's just do like this, we receive some subscriber, let's type it as, uh, let's make it, for example, order request subscriber. So we received here subscriber which accepts order requests, right? And now we can pass this guy to, to, because this is an actual subscriber, to our chain. Did you get what's going on here? So we basically, in order to propagate the, the chain of publisher, we have to create another publisher which, is, has, which has access to, to subscriber at subscription time and assembly time. So we will be able to get an access to this subscriber and provide proper business logic for runtime run by applying this decoration, this basically uh, Russian doll pattern. So in fact, we have along with just plain um, subscribers decoration, we have to go a little bit further. We have to provide some decoration during assembly and subscription time in order to have access to everything, to have con proper control under the whole uh, pipeline that we created. So basically what we have to do, we have to chain along with our subscribers, we have to chain our publishers. So RA publisher will be wrapped by map publisher. So map publisher at the subscription time will have access to, to the parent and we have to, will have access to the downstream subscriber. Then we, ha we have to pass another publisher into another publisher and so forth and so on in order to create this pipeline or this proper chain. And once we subscribe, this subscriber will be decorated by map subscriber, map subscriber will be decorated by another map subscriber, and afterwards our top sub publisher will receive proper chained or kind of decorated properly uh, subscriber at which we are going to invoke on next, on error, and on complete methods in runtime. Does it make sense? Okay, great. So let's do that. Let's make a little bit of refactoring here. Now let's create map publisher here, which extends publisher, and the publisher this time will be type of the out. So here we have to, to generify our map publisher as well a little bit, and now we have to yeah, change to implement, of course, and now we have to implement subscribe method. And as you can see, subscri subscribe method provides us with a proper type, which is our type of subscriber, or we can rem uh, rename it to actual subscriber, or downstream subscriber. Now we have to move our map subscriber inside publisher, so it, it became a static part of our map publisher, Let's make it um, internal one. And now we, what we have to do, we have to get an access of upstream to upstream publisher or, or to parent publisher. So we have to have an access of publisher which produce elements of type in. Let's put it as a part of our constructor for map publisher. And now we will be able to, to provide a proper chain because now we are going to, to call the subscriber on our parent publisher and we will provide a decorated, uh, decorated version of actual subscriber. Yeah, of course we have to have mapper here, mapper function here. So let's just copy paste it here. And that will be golden. So now we have to provide mapper, actual subscriber, and that, that's all we have to do here. Is it clear what's going on? Any questions so far? So now if you're going to write our business logic in this way, we would have to do something like new map publisher, which accept order publisher because this is a parent publisher and this guy applies, for example, one operation so afterwards, we will get map publisher, which map order request to currency grouped order. Muppet publisher one. 
Then we have to take map publisher again. We have to create another map publisher which accepts mapped, uh, mapped publisher one and apply another function. For example, to what the next action is to currency order. And this will be the second map publisher in our chain. And so for and so on, we have to produce the third one, which convert order, uh, order request to order total. And afterwards, we will chain everything into one, one pipeline, right? That's what will happen. Yeah, let's just keep it as is. We don't want to waste our time on writing all this business logic. It, it clear how we have to chain it in the current stage everything, but let's just return this guy in order to make code compile, compiling, and let's go to the next stage and let's try to create a proper verification. We have to write to every publisher TCK. Do you remember that, right? So we have to check whether our publisher is proper. At this point in time, let's just quickly try to modify this test. Let's just try to provide verification of mapping, so we have to wrap our array publisher into map publisher in order to check whether map publisher behaves correctly, right? So in order to wrap, we have to, in order to make proper decoration, we have to do this, and in fact, we have to, to write something like this. So we got element here, and in order to convert element to string, we have to, to do something like this, and that's it. Do you see any, any picture, like in this kind of code, maybe pi some pyramid, if we try to write a little bit more decorations around one into another? This is basically the same pyramid of, um, of doom as we have in JavaScript, but that's fine in, at, for this point in time. So let's just run our test and see whether it works or not. So these guys, will not be, oh, go. oh no, lots of them were crushed, no subscriber. So I made something wrong. So let's just check what I did in the wrong way. And this, we have, yes, this subscriber, actual subscriber. So everything should be pretty fine. What's going on? What's went wrong? Oh, yeah. I forgot to propagate, to, to, to make a proper propagation or delegation of all invocations. So I have to call on my actual subscriber. I have to call on subscription, and I have to bypass subscription, right? And I have to do, of course, an error propagation here as well. And on completion propagation in order to complete the whole chaining, right? So let's just rerun the test again. And we will see that all tests, yeah, why it didn't work again. So in any case, the te all test will be passed because the verification is really simple, so let's just Comment all these guys, so I'll just try to clear them and try to run the test suit again. And now, yeah, we can see that everything is, is passing. And there is a few untested cases, but in general, everything were verified, right? It works. So it, it should work. But now let's go back to the slides and let's just check a few more cases. Be considered the plain proper successful propagation of element with proper mapping. But just imagine, yeah, everything is chained in the decoration and we invokes one into another, and uh, the same with our publishers. But just imagine that we are kind of, we as a users of this library can provide basically anything, right? Just imagine what if our lambda maps one element into null, right? We have to protect our streams against null. You remember there is a specific kind of uh, part of the specification, so null is unacceptable, so we have to throw an exception. So what happens if we throw an exception in the middle of our stream? What, have we to, what do we have to do? 
Or just imagine that you got an exception inside, uh, inside, inside your Lambda. What you have to do. So if you're going to run, if you're going to run our test, for example, of write an additional test which checks what will happen inside mapper, which throws an exception. So this is basically the chain of mapper, and this lambda throws a runtime exception once an element came into here. And what we expect that we just requested elements. We don't expect, expect any on next invocation, and we, and we just expect only one invo invocation of an error call, right? We have to receive only one terminal call. So if you're going to run this particular test, we will see that it will fail. Because we expected only one exception with, um, so what is runtime for test, right? So ex we expected only one exception where it failed. Yeah, it failed here. It applied mapping, so yeah. It, it wasn't even propagated to our, to our uh, subscriber, which is absolutely incorrect. This exception were just thrown, was, was just thrown here, and the tests were failed. In our case, we have to handle all possible cases. We have to protect our stream against some uh, um, unexpected failure, and we have to propagate catch the exception, caught exception as a normal on error signal, right? So we have to modify our stream. Let's do that quickly. We have only 20 minutes before the end. So what we have to do? In order to protect again against any exception that could happen during the mapping, we have to wrap our, uh, our map function, this guy. We have to wrap it into try-catch section, right? So we have to handle all kind of exceptions. It doesn't matter which kind of them, uh, of exception, but we once it appear, we have to, to handle it. Otherwise, if everything is pretty fine, we have to achieve the proper result and send it downstream. So in case we got a result, kind of in case we got an exception from here, we have to somehow process it, right? For example, we have to, to say, okay, this should be a proper, a proper signal over our chain, so we have to call on error, and we which propagate the proper error to, to downstream, right? Does it make sense? So, okay, let's try to rerun this test and see whether it works or not. Yeah, of course, we, in case of error, we have to just return in order to make it compile. And yeah, let's just run, but still, test is red. Why it's red? So let's take a look at this guy and what we see here. We expected only one on error or terminal signal, but we received a few more. So if you're going to log this guy, we will see that we, okay, we got, print and we got, we got error, and we are going to log this error, and if you're going to rerun this test, we will see that this error appeared twice. So we send an error, but the problem is that upstream, nothing knows with, uh, about this error, right? has nothing to do about this error. This is only an, for an error for our downstream, right? So in fact, if you're going to, to build proper intermediate operator, we have to consider this case where, for example, we are mapping to null or we are handling an exception. And in case we got something incorrect inside our kind of applying of the mapper or function or whatever external, related to external world uh, processing, we have to cancel from upstream in order to say, okay, please stop sending us data, and we have to send an error to our downstream, right? Does it make sense? But uh, when you call cancel, there is no guarantee that we are next. Right. That's good check kind of catch up, and that's why we have to apply a few more uh, protection from here. First of all, let's just say, okay, we want to cancel from, from, what, from whom? We don't have any access to subscription which means that we have to apply another decoration here, and we, along with just a plain subscriber, we have to extend from subscription. This is another pattern that which you will uh, see on any intermediate operator in any library like RxJava 2 or Project Reactor. So we have to extend subscription. Now what we have to do, we have to store this subscription in the field along with any other 
fields. So we have to, okay, subscription, encryption, uh, upstream, let's call it upstream. So we, instead of sending or propagating the subscription to, to downstream, we will send ourselves as, as a subscription because we are a subscription as well. And we will delegate all the calls through all the pipeline up and down. Now we are going to use this upstream in order to delegate request calls and in order to delegate cancel invocations, right? So now we have an access to proper upstream subscription and we have to just say cancel, let's just cancel upstream subscription and let's just say send an error to downstream. So okay, if you're going to rerun, it will be much better. In, in this case, it will be passed. But in fact, there is a case where everything happens asynchronously. So we have to consider what if the cancellation is a synchronous process and we can still receive an ele an ele some elements afterwards. So we have to protect ourselves against this. So we have to create a field, like a flag. Boolean field, call it done, which means we are done or terminated, let's rename it to terminated, which will be turned to true once one of those methods were invoked. So we terminated here, we say, okay, this is terminated. We terminated here, we say this terminated. In case it already has already been terminated, we have to just say return. Because again, we can receive completion of upstream after we made our own completion, right? So we have to expect this, this and we have to just protect uh, this invocation uh, in this way. Someone of yours could wonder why this field is non, not volatile. Because of the same reasons, because of the same guarantees from the specification, like all those invocations are serialized, which means it happens before we're presented, uh, we're kind of in place, uh, before invocation of those methods, so everything will be up to date uh, in terms of access to or visibility of, of the state of those fields, right? So we have to just put all these kind of protections here. Here you can just create an additional logic. You can say, okay, I can provide some handler for, for dropped elements in case such appear and then you can collect some important dropped elements and process them afterwards. Right? That what ha that's something you can find in real libraries like Project Reactor, for example. Let's take a look at Flux Map. And if you're going to take a look at the Flux Map inner, uh, it's the complex one. Okay, it's Flux Flat Map. I, I want to Flux Map. Yeah, here we go. This one is much more simpler. So in case we got some redundant elements, there is a particular static hook which allows us to supply dropped element to a particular consumer which then post-process those dropped element without a uh, kind of notification for our actual subscriber. So you can put any logic here in order to preserve stability of your system. So far so good? Any questions? All right, so let's go back to our map publisher uh, map publisher, and that's basically what we have to do. Yeah, we have to add some verification or check whether the element is null or not. So we have to put, for example, the, system, the simplest um, utility method from JDK, like require not null, which is basically check whether the object is null and throw null pointer exception or return whether it's not null. Does it make sense? Okay, I guess it does. And that's basically it. That's what we have to do to, pro to provide, to implement proper end-to-end -end, uh, kind of golden implementation of uh, intermediate operator like map subscriber, like map operator. And now, like this is the first part. We can create take subscriber, tap, take operator, and take publisher, and take subscriber, and filter, and so forth and so on. But we will have, any, in any case, we will have this kind of chaining, of data chaining. We would have to 
drop one map publisher into another, and then in order to provide some more functionality, we would have to wrap another map publisher into another map publisher. And in any case, our code will be like this, like a pyramid, right? And that's something we, we don't want to uh, kind of tackle, and we don't want to give our, our users to, to our users code, such code like this, but we want to provide some functional approach, which will simplify in general data or pipeline um, assembling and will simplify general code readability. So in order to, to implement such library, such, such end-to-end -end library, we have to apply some such immutable or immutable builder pattern, which is basically a set of static methods, methods inside the class, which allows you to, to get an access to current builder or to current, current publisher, then provide some decoration inside this method and return new one without giving an access to proper chaining for, for your users. So what we have to do afterwards in order to finalize our library, we have to create a kind of, since we don't want to repeat the same, the, same, um, the same set of methods on every publisher, because basically we have to, to consider, we have to create some, for example, map operation which accept any which accept, for example, function, which map A to B, and then we have to return publisher as a result. And in fact, this will, should be map publisher, right? And we have to apply the same set of uh, methods to every, to every operator, because under the hood, we have to get an access to this, to current publisher, to parent publisher, and apply new map publisher on top of it. So we have to do something like this. Mapper here. Does it make sense? Like such kind of chaining. In order to not write the same code again and again, we can create some base or abstract class. For example, we can call it flow. Let's make it abstract. Let's generify this flow type like this. Let's make it implement the publisher of the same generic type T. Now we don't have to write any implementation here. We have to just provide the set of generic methods, like for example, map, which return flow of type out, and which accept a function of type in and out. And what else do I have? Yeah, I have to specify that the out type is generic one, and yeah, the in type is basically T type, or a, just let me just rename this as an input type, and this will be a mapper, mapper. Now we have mapper as a parameter to function inside, like on the level of the, of the class, which means if you're going to extend our map publisher or any publisher from the flow, so instead of using for example, just uh, interface, we can use here flow. It means that any array publisher will have a parent method called map, right? So now we have this as any publisher which extends flow. So once we apply, so we have to extend here from flow again in order to, to to make every class extends flow, we will be able to provide a proper chain of invocation. So now we can create, for example, st some static methods. For example, in order to create the beginning of the, our chain, and we can return of, uh, for example, the flow of inter in input type, and we can say, okay, we want to create flow from array. And we can put here either generic type, like this, Input, uh, yeah, like this. Anyways, what's wrong? Anyway, I forgot the Java. What's, oh yeah, right. The problem is that it doesn't see input type. Yeah, it, now it's better. 
and now you can easily create, for example, new array publisher as an input from the input given in the static method, right? And then what you will get, now you can see that the result or the, f the library will be much more um, smoother and interesting for any user because now you can say, okay, I want to create a flow from an array, so I want to generate n of elements, like this is the array of uh, n elements. Now I want to apply a map because I have, because any class, any publisher in my system extends the same uh, abstract class which has static methods along with the method on the level of the class. So I have an access on particular instead of, uh, of this method. And I can, now I can simply provide any mapping here like this and map my element to stream really simply. And here we go. Now we can add filter, take whatever methods, but in any case we will extend them from the same abstract class which has all type of mappings, filtering uh, on the level of this class. So we can add here filter, we can add here take and so forth and so on. And afterwards we will get proper fully implemented reactive library with the same DSL like in Rx Java or Project Reactor, right? That's cool. And yeah, that's basically it. We don't have, we have only four minutes, so I have to provide a few more notes uh, about, anyway, performance and uh, in general some notes on performance and optimization of your flows that you are going to write using Rx Java or Project Reactor using the same chain of operators. In general, you have all, every time you write a pipeline, you have to remember that the complexity of, uh, of every operator is uh, high. What, what does it mean? Like every map publisher produce one publisher, right? One object of publisher. And then it produces at the subscription type one more subs kind of subscriber, which is subscriber and subscription. So by writing one map here, we, we produce to our pipeline two objects plus lambda. Does it make sense, right? If we, if we write a few more map operations like this, like this, and like this, we can apply some simple math in order to calculate how many objects we have already created. Here we created two objects, here we created two objects, here we created two objects. So the formula is we have n operators which produces two objects, so it will be two n objects to our garbage collector. Plus we have here one publisher, like if, if it is array publisher, it will be one publisher plus one subscription, right? In case we are going to look to more complex operators like publish on, flat map, or more advanced operators, we will see that we produce much more objects. Flat map produces one subscription, a few queues inside because there is complexity of um, flat map internals. It produces the same number of subscribers. So um, in general, you get much more objects to your memory. So if you're going to, to analyze this, you will see that in general object overhead that we have with reactive streams looks like this. We create publisher, subscriber, subscri or subscription and elements during the runtime. For example, comparing that to Java streams, Java streams produces a little bit less objects. So in case of synchronous, uh, synchronous stream, uh, the number of producers, uh, produced object for Java stream will be uh, more kind of less expensive in processing using Java stream. In order to compare it with imperative programming, we will see that imperative programming does not provide any wrappers, any additional objects, along just, just the kind of objects related to business logic. What does it mean? In order, if you're going to, yeah, if you're going to, to calculate the, the, the same number of invocations afterwards, we will see that we have n number of on next, we have n number of real function invocations, and we have m number of requests because we have back pressure, so we have to call request in order to get some few on next, and then we have to call request in order to get few on next. Java stream, just accept, like because uh, in the chain there is sync, accept, etc., and real fu function invocation. And imperative streams, or imperative programming, just 
only invokes the real business function without any additional calls. So now if you're going to, to take some performance measurement and take a look at the how, for example, uh, reactive streams uh, impact performance comparing to imperative programming, uh, and we create, for example, a stream of two objects, you will see that performance overhead in reactive streams is about 15%, right? So this is something. Just imagine that you have lots of small streams like you accept one mono in, from Project Reactor and returns one mono as a result of your business uh, function invocation, right? So you, you create every time you create one mono, one mono, one mono. In, in case you got a few transfer, transformations inside your business logic, then you could impact your performance much, um, even much more. So you have to remember that object is really expensive. So in case short stream is just 15%, for four maps, for example. In case of uh, longer stream, for example, 10, 10 elements, this is 6%. And 1 million elements, this is only 3%, right? This is something. So in any case, if you want to write really clean business logic use, use, uh, using functional transformation, you have to kind of separate all the transformation only for long running streams. Because they, they are running for, for a long time and there is only overhead from, for, from um, kind of dynamic function invocation. Yeah. So what you have to remember in general, you have to reduce the, the general number of operators uh, to, to the maximum, like it should be one map, for example, which applies all the, all the synchronous, synchronous transformation like mapping as we have seen uh, in our plane application. You have to use imperative as much as possible because imperative is super uh, good for just-in-time compiler. It's simple as possible. It doesn't produce any additional business logic. Of course, it's a little bit, it, a little bit ugly, but it's performant. So if you care about performance, you have to consider write some particular parts imperatively. Afterwards, we just created some small li uh, library which apply, uh, which has one data source. We saw all the patterns used in, uh, during the implementation. You will see the same patterns in the real libraries. If you're going to, to, to take a look at Reactor, you will see the same patterns like work in progress, in flat map, in publish on. You will meet all them uh, in, in any other unrelated places. Uh, the main pattern for operators is combination of subscriber and subscription and then de decorating everything. So this is Russian doll pattern or uh, Matryoshka pattern. And that's basically what you have to, to know about uh, implementation of real own reactive library. So if you still got any questions, uh, please you're more than welcome to, to ask me uh, the backstage because this is a time for, for almost the time for the next session. If you're curious about uh, source code and slides, you can find them on these QR codes. And Thank you for your attention. Again, I will be there. So if you want to ask me something, I'm still here. <laughs>